Off, changing the order around. You whet our appetites. We'll be all the more ready for that song when we come to the Lord's table. But to prepare you for the Lord's table, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I came across this text and uh, felt it would be very appropriate tonight, mainly because of what I want to do next Sunday. I was going to do it today. Uh, there's been, uh, as you know, quite a bit of conversation about the latest wave of immigration and so forth, and it just raises the larger Christian issue, uh, the larger question and issue of Christian liberty and decisions in the gray areas, and one of the great texts on that, we'll also come to that next year in Romans uh, 14 and 15, but also 1 Corinthians 8 and 10. And so as I looked at the section, 1 Corinthians 10, about how to make godly wise decisions in the gray areas, that it's not right or wrong. Uh, it's, it's more a matter of wise or unwise, and uh, it, may, it may differ from person to person. Uh, I, I looked at the text and I thought, hang on, to set the stage for verses... 23 and following, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23 and following, what we're going to look at next week, Paul brings us to the Lord's table and he talks about communion and I thought, hang on, that's what we're doing Sunday night, we're having communion and we haven't had a sermon, uh, one, or, one of our elders recently mentioned, you know, why don't you preach a sermon on communion, so I thought, hmm, what better time than now. Also in light of yesterday's and Friday night's seminar, we uh, were reminded all the more of the reality of uh, paganism and worldliness and uh, 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 the uh, debauched culture around us. And so we uh, were challenged by Gavin Peacock to not conform to that. And this is a passage that very much confronts our uh, worldliness as well. And uh, uh, it's always timely to talk about the Lord's table. It doesn't need any uh, defense, does it? Um, 1 Corinthians could be uh, it really entitled, the whole epistle could be entitled, God's Church in Satan's City. Or uh, someone has said, it's about saints gone wild. Or you could title this whole epistle, Getting the World Out of the Church, How the Gospel Cures Our Worldliness. It, some would say it's Paul's most practical of all of his epistles. 16 chapters answering one question, does the gospel really matter? Does it make any difference in how we live our lives in this defiled world? And as we come to chapter 10, before we read our passage, Paul is at the end of a section that began in chapter 8. Look at how he begins there in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols. Verse 4, also in chapter 8. Therefore concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols. And then he covers that over the next three chapters. Chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10 is essentially addressing how Christians ought to handle idol food, which you're about to see is way more relevant and contemporary today than you might have realized. But he comes to the bottom line here in chapter 10, the root of this great temptation to dine at idol feasts, to abuse your Christian liberty, to flaunt your freedoms in Christ, and to compromise your faith and to conform to the world. The root of it all is now exposed from chapter 10, verse 14. Let's read this passage. Let's stand as we hear God's word, and then I will pray and explain the way forward. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10 from verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? Father, as we come to this passage, as we prepare for the Lord's table, as we gather as a church family 
and share in this meal and remember this, these truths and rejoice in the gospel and uh, remind ourselves of all that this table represents. We pray that by your spirit you would teach us and that your name would be honored in our midst and that your jealousy would be understood and that it would not be provoked, and, but that your honor would be upheld and that your meal would be uh, uh, more cherished and, and understood and valued and prized by us as a church body. In your son's name we pray, amen. I also uh, threw off the order in realizing that we're going to give thanks for a new baby in the church, but we're going to do that at the end. So I didn't forget, uh, Tom. So <laughs> I, uh, we, we, we're, we almost never do communion at the end of the sermon, so it's good to get out of our rut. So uh, I didn't forget baby Elliot's mark. So uh, we're going to do it at the end. Uh, but it's a family table, so we are going to share together in that time and give thanks for his goodness in our midst But I want you to look at this command as he begins this passage tonight in verse 14 and 15. And then we'll get into the specific outline and uh, the application that Paul gives us. If you'd like a title tonight, let's call it, Where Do You Dine? Where Do You Dine? (laughs) What, What table are you eating at? And what table does the Lord want you to be most identified by? Look at verse 14, the governing imperative, the main command here that will prepare us for our outline in a moment. Verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Idols were the landscape of Corinth, right? Long before iPads and iPods and iTunes and iPhones, they had idols, right? (laughs) Sorry, Sunday night. Gotta, 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 gotta keep you with me somehow. All right. I think I'll blame one of my kids for that one. I can't remember. <laughs> we'll leave them unnamed. It was the norm. This was life in Corinth as much as uh, in the Eastern world uh, today with Hinduism or Buddhism or uh, animism in much of Africa. The gods or the spirits control everything and the fear of them drives everything. You couldn't do business or commerce or recreation or family life without paying respect to the local deities. Uh, Polytheism, what does that mean? Young people, give me a definition. Polytheism, theism, God, the worship of, not one God, monotheism, but the worship of how many? Many gods. Polytheism was the vibe. Polytheism was the pulse. Polytheism was the way of life at Corinth. Just as much as more than mining in South Africa or uh, consumerism in America. Without polytheism, Corinth would have crumbled. It was the fabric of society. It was the framework for all of life. I mean, on every horizon in Corinth, I visited there even today, as I know others of you have, there is temples. Every, you couldn't have a postage stamp. You couldn't have a logo. You couldn't have a, you couldn't send a postcard from Corinth without them showing off. You couldn't have a coin without them showing off one of their temples, right? Apollo or Zeus or their most notorious one up on the Acropolis, the temple of Aphrodite with her hundreds of uh, prostitutes at your service. This was life in Corinth. No wonder this epistle has been called God's Church in Satan's City. Sounds actually a lot like Johannesburg, does it not? And into this idolatrous setting, Paul's words ring out loud and clear, don't they? Look again at the text, verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, no wonder he's being so tender and kind. Dear friends, as it were, uh, treasured ones, what I'm about to say is going to cut close to the bone, but you need to know it comes out of a care and a love for you. Dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Fugo is the original word. Sound familiar? Where we get the English word? Fugitive. Present continuous action here. You can't capture this with a photo. You need a video footage, right? Keep running away from. Never stop evading. Always be escaping from these idols. Don't stop and admire them. Don't feel nostalgic about them. Don't envy the success that your friends say the gods have brought them. No. One word. Flee, right? Run fast and hard away from these idols. Stop discussing them and exploring them and seeing how close you can get to them. Run far away from them. 
you see, the Corinthians were not unlike Christians today. We're tempted to, they were tempted, like we would have been, to say, what's the harm of a little snack at Apollo's temple? I mean, what's the deal about taking my wife out on a date to Zeus's diner? I mean, come on, you legalistic Christians, relax. I mean, these idols are a joke. It's a load of rubbish. Idols don't exist. Who cares if we exploit them? They got the best steak in town. Why should the devil have all the good food and drink? And Paul says, not so. Idolatry is not some old pal that you can still cozy up to and have a chat with every now and then. Idolatry is not some friendly neighbor that's just smiling and waving at you when you drive by, right? No, idolatry is a masked man stalking you in the park. Idolatry is that suspicious car that follows you home. Idolatry is a sniper that has you in its sights. Get away from it! Flee, he says. Remember how the final verse in 1 John, chapter 5, verse 21, little children, guard yourselves from idols. What did Calvin say? The human heart is an idol factory, forever churning out more and more idols. J.C. Ryle says, the besetting sin of God's people Israel throughout the Old Testament can be summed up in one word, idolatry. Israel, he says, was incessantly turning aside after idols and worshiping the work of men's hands. Is it any different today? Is it any different at all? Secular anthropologist Tanya Luhrmann, a couple years ago in the States, did a fascinating study after four years of research of a major charismatic denomination. The book is entitled, When God Talks Back. Are you ready for this? Mrs. Lerman, in her book, concludes that churches today are training people to interpret their own internal feelings as the voice of God. Sound like most of Christianity in Johannesburg? After four years of research, she concluded, sadly, churches are training people to interpret their own internal feelings as the voice of God. Instead of learning doctrine and hearing God through his word and scripture, the focus now is on experiencing regular dialogue with the Almighty. You know, Lord, what should I wear today? You know, this tie, this tie. In other words, creating a God of our own imagination. No longer the God of the Bible. But that's just one of many examples of what Paul is warning, even in the church, especially in the church. Flee idolatry, any form of distorting God, visualizing God, not trusting God, thinking wrongly about God. Let's bring this even closer to home, brothers and sisters. Each of us, let's ask ourselves, in what ways am I an idolater? What God substitutes, what Jesus alternatives might be occupying the throne of my heart Remember Martin Luther said, before you commit any sin, you first commit idolatry. Do you know that? Before you commit any sin, you first commit idolatry, right? What's the first of the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me, right? Anytime we break any of the other nine commandments, you lie, you steal, you lust, you get angry, the root is craving something else more than craving God, right? Seeking to please myself in some other way rather than pleasing God. Look back at verse 6 in this chapter. All of Israel's problems go back to their cravings, their evil cravings. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Desiring something more than God, longing for something more than God, seeking satisfaction for something more than God, running for refuge or peace or security or identity. Anywhere or anyone more than God. That's why Ephesians 5 and Colossians chapter 3 call greed or covetous desires that control you as synonymous with idolatry. Flee idolatry. And by the way, brothers and sisters, you can't detect your idols alone. You need a local church family. You need other believers to assist you with idol detection. It's a community project. If I knew all my blind spots, I'd fix them. I need you and you need me so that as we encourage one another, Hebrews 3 says, we're not, so that we're not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin and we are helped to see and to repent and forsake and confess our idols. Flee idolatry, he says. I love the hymn writer who prayed, the dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. 
Next verse, 15. Look in your Bibles. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. But I thought there was not supposed to be any judging in the church. Read the verse again. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. He's appealing to them as sensible, rational people. In in the coming verses, verse 16 and following, he's going to fire off seven rhetorical questions. In other words, decide for yourself whether idolatry is worth it or not, whether it is a reasonable, sensible Christian thing to do or not. Judge for yourself. And so, our outline briefly this evening Three reasons to flee idolatry. Three reasons to stop dining with the devil, you could say. And to devote yourself exclusively to Christ. That's what this table is for as we come to the Lord's table. To remind us that he bought us at the highest price and we are his, we're his alone. And if we come to this table dragging our idols with us, plopping our little Dagon onto the table as it were, bringing a heart that's full of lust or porn or, or, or greed or, or, or any other form of idolatry, we come with defiled hands and we risk bringing judgment upon ourselves. This table matters because Jesus matters and he wants all of you, not half of you. And so that's where we're going tonight. Very briefly, well, first of all, the first reason to flee idolatry is because we share in the Lord's table. And then the second reason, because we don't want to share in the demon's table. And then thirdly, we don't want to arouse God's jealousy. First reason, verse 16 and 17. Why do we flee idolatry? Because we share in the Lord's table. We share in the Lord's table, verses 16 and 17. Look at how Paul begins to, shall we say, set the table for us here in his argument. Look at verse 16 in your Bibles. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? What's going on here in a minute? It's not what the Catholics would say, that it becomes the body and blood of Jesus, the view known as transubstantiation. Nor would we agree with the Lutherans, however much we would appreciate their, their many other doctrines. It does not, Jesus is not with and in the body and the blood either, a view known as consubstantiation. It's neither of those, but we believe there is something spiritual and significant about what go, what's going on here. Catholics believe in the real physical presence of Jesus, the real presence of Jesus, and sometimes Baptists have been ac- accused of believing in the real absence of Jesus. Don't come to this table believing in the real absence of Jesus. Whatever we know, Jesus ain't here. Our view is a little stronger than that. Verse 16. We are sharing. Koinonia. That's where the, the name communion comes from. It's not about what's going on in the elements. It's what's going on in the participants. It's not what's going on at the table. It's what's going on in your heart. And in our corporate worship as we partake, as we share in the blood of Christ. It can't be physically, because how was the first communion introduced? Jesus physically sat there, and he held up the Pesach Passover elements, and he said, this is my body. Any, judge for yourself, can I borrow Paul's language? Was he talking about his own physical body when he wasn't even dead yet? No, clearly at that table he was saying symbolically, representatively, metaphorically, this is my body, this is my blood. And so today, we know we're sharing in the benefits of his poured out life, his blood shed at Calvary. We are sharing in the benefits, the blessings, the gifts, the riches, the spiritual Overflow that has come to us from his broken body. Verse 16, we commune in his blood, we commune in his body, meaning we join in the benefits, we feast upon the riches that he purchased for us at Calvary. Christ, not only the host of this meal, but also he is the meal, spiritually nourishing us with himself. We come to commune with Christ and with one another. Beloved, tell me something that better weans your heart off of idols than coming to this table. 
I can't think of many things that more expose my heart, bring me back to love Christ, remind me not to love the world than the Lord's table. Can I just preach to the choir for a minute? You're here on a Sunday night. Why do most Christians not come to Sunday night church? Are you ready? If I had to pick one word, plenty of exceptions, plenty of exceptions, right? <laughs> Starts with an S, ends with an M. Secularism. Secularism. The world owns our weekends. And God is jealous for our hearts. We don't have to come to church on Sunday night. It wouldn't be sin if the elders said, you know what, we're not going to have Sunday night church anymore. But what we love, as Protestants have done for centuries, Sunday night, the Lord's Day, the whole day, when there's freedom to meet. So many countries, it's not even an option. When we're able to meet, when we're able to take communion a second time a month, not just once a month, it's one more chance to push back against the world who wants to claim your time and claim you with every sporting event and every weekend thing and every this and every that so that eventually all that is left is a little one hour takeaway on Sunday morning if there's no birthday parties or if granny's not having breakfast. And the Lord says, I want you. I want all of you. Secularism, I refuse to cave in. I refuse to capitulate. I need to draw a line in the sand that says, I'm yours, Lord. Whatever, it might look different in different cultures. I'm yours, Lord. I will be owned by Jesus, not secularism, which is all about the here and the now and the me and the mine, and heaven just becomes less and eternity becomes less and the saints and scripture and the gospel become less and all my stuff and all my busy life becomes more and more and more. God help us. I know I'm preaching to the choir. God is jealous for us. And the Lord's day and the Lord's table is a time to say no to the idols of our society. Flee idolatry, he says. Come to this meal. Share in the Lord's table. Keep reading verse 17. There's one bread. We who are many are one body before we all partake of the one bread. All the little pieces that are about to be passed around did not begin as fragments. They began as a whole. It's a great picture of the body of Christ. And we as elders can tell you, and, and the deacons of this church as well can testify, there's not a month that goes by that there's not some threat to the unity of this body. And someone, somehow, that wants to divide this body and pull us away from oneness. And so this table, twice a month, and our gatherings, as often as we can gather on Sundays and in small groups, remind us that we are one and we will not be divided. One bread, one body. We partake, we commune, that rich word again, we koinonia, we share together. Number two. First reason we flee idolatry, not only because we share in the Lord's table, secondly, because we don't want to share in the demon's table. We don't want to share in the demon's table. Flee idolatry lest you share in the demon's table. Keep reading, verse 18. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? Read Leviticus, read Deuteronomy. Priests and the people were allowed to eat some of the beef <laughs> after they offered up their sacrifice and you didn't get to choose hmm am i going to munch or am i going to worship your worshiping was dining and your dining was worshiping it was both or it was neither and so paul is saying you don't get to separate your life and go oh that's just what i do on weekends that's just what i do on friday nights or that's what me and my my secular friends do on Saturdays. But then at church, that's what I do with my Christian friends. No. Paul's saying, where you eat represents what you worship. Are not, look at the get verse again, verse 18. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices shares in the altar? Keep reading verse 19. What do I mean then? I love it when he says that. <laughs> That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? <laughs> Paul's saying, I'm not conceding that for a moment. He said that back in chapter 8, verse 4. Idols are bogus. They are nothing. They are wood and stone and they are dead and it's a lie. But it's not a game. 
there is a spiritual battle going on. Verse 20. No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You see, the world also has communion services. You ever notice that? Whether it's people that love certain kind of musical concerts and they follow that brand of music uh, wherever it is, or people who love sports, or people who are into the latest yoga, or a thousand other things, often innocent, harmless things even. Soon you realize that's your church, right? We've all been to the gym. You've got the people who gym to be fit, and the people who gym to worship. That's their church. The priest is the trainer, right? (laughs) The altar is whether you prefer upper body or lower body that day. (laughs) Whether you do thighs or biceps, right? And so it is. It's not if you worship, it's just where you worship. and Who you worship, right? Pagan gods are false, but demons are real. Satan knows how to set the table. He's been doing it for millennia, ever since the Garden of Eden, right? All religions are not equal. All religions don't lead to God. Paul pulls no punches here in his view of pagan religions. They are demonic. They are satanic. Have you ever wondered what gives false religion their sticking power? I mean, why? In our pride, in our arrogance, we look at a bunch of people, for example, in the Hindu religion, going down to the river Ganges and believing the most bizarre things about this filthy river washing their sins away. And, 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 and then you see people throwing their, their babies into the fire and all these wicked things that pagan religions do. And you think, why do they keep going back again and again and again? It's, see, it's because it's not explainable naturally. Only Satan and demonic power can explain such irrational, horrific idolatry. That's what Paul's saying here. Demons are behind it. Not everything supernatural is from God, right? Satan also has miracle working powers to a point. We saw that in Exodus, right? We saw it in the book of Revelation with Antichrist. All power is not pure. Some is demonic. And so we're to be we're warned here. Beloved, don't be like the Corinthians thinking you can still dine at the temple of false religion and in worldly places and not be stained. If you're dining at their temples and eating their foods, you're fellowshipping with their Lord, right? You just paid a visit to Cafe Lucifer. (laughs) You just spent the night at uh, uh, Beelzebub's (laughs) B&B. You just had a lovely feast at the diner of the Red Dragon. You just popped into Apollyon's takeaway. That's what he's saying here. The things the Gentiles sacrifice is to demons, not to God. Don't be a sharer in demons. He's saying to this worldly church at Corinth, if you insist on pushing the boundaries and keeping up with the culture and seeing what you can get away with, you might as well go back to Aaron and the golden calf that you're bowing down to. Beloved, you need to fill in the blank. You and I are... There's going to be as many applications to fleeing idols and forsaking the worldliness of our culture today. There will be as many applications as there are people in this room. I can't, uh, we can't babysit you. The Spirit of God has to drive this truth home to your heart even as we come to the Lord's table in a moment. I don't know if it's bachelor and bachelorette parties that you had no business being at. Maybe it's a wedding reception that you should have left two hours earlier. Maybe it's birthday, anniversary parties. Maybe it's, who knows, year-end functions. Maybe it's stuff you're watching, music you're listening to, things that entertain you, where a child of God should, has no business to be there. Maybe in certain contexts, it's a tombstone unveiling. It's a sacrifice to ancestors. It's a cleansing ceremony with holy water in a stadium where there was a stampede. Do you remember that? Ellis Park? I remember... For once, I was in someone's house in Poliquani, and we were watching on TV, and there was a Christian minister from a mega church here in Johannesburg holding the uh, hyssop branch with the African Sangomas cleansing the stadium in the name of Jesus. Michelle and I thought, what in the world? Flee idolatry. The Christian has no business there. 
And here's the final warning. Why do we flee idolatry? Why do we forsake worldliness and devote ourselves exclusively to the Lord who bought us with his blood? First of all, we share in the Lord's table. Second of all, so we don't share in demon's table. And third of all, so we don't arouse God's jealousy. Arouse God's jealousy. Look at verse 21 as Paul continues. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Children, imagine tomorrow morning is breakfast and you have breakfast at two different tables. I know little boys are going, great, double breakfast. (laughs) But if you're eating at two tables at the same time, it's going to get really messy. It doesn't work that way. How much more in the spiritual realm, right? Many Christians think they can have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. They can have their Sunday behavior and then they can have their Monday behavior. God help us. It arouses his jealousy. And the Lord says, as Joshua said to the people, choose you this day who you will serve. If Baal is God, serve him. If the Lord is God, serve him. Don't you understand? Love, you know, friendship with the world is hostility to, with God. The, he who loves the world does not have the love of the Father. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. Either money is your God and go serve money and be consistent and just admit it or serve God and forsake money. There is no middle ground. Who owns you? Where do you dine? What table identifies you? What culture is yours. I love that story of Martin Lloyd Jones. Do you remember the great London expositor was a fine medical doctor at one of the top hospitals in London. And he was he was saved and now he was sensing a call to the ministry. And he went to the typical thing that upper echelon London doctors do of a fine classical concert of some sort. And then he came out and there was this little Salvation Army band. <laughs> They're just playing their little music and preaching on the street. Repent, believe. Jesus wants to save you from your sin. And he was with all his friends and black ties and fancy. And he looked over and the Lord just struck him. And he said, Those are my people. Those are my people. I can't do it anymore. I've been playing with the world long enough. I'm I'm Christ's, I'm his. And that was his call to the ministry. He says, I'm a sojourner, I'm a stranger, I'm a pilgrim, I'm tired of trying to serve two masters. Lord, I'm yours and yours fully, whatever that means. And for him, it meant to become a full-time preacher of the gospel. Praise God for that kind of calling, that kind of courage. Don't be a fence-sitter, don't be a two-timer, a walking contradiction, as it were. Look at the final verse. Again, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he. Are we? Husbands, how would it feel for you to share your wife? Wives, would it ever even cross your mind to say, you know, we've been married a long time. I think I'll just, I don't want to be so selfish with, you know, I'm hogging my husband. You know, maybe I should be more generous with my husband. Rubbish! God forbid blasphemous to speak of marriage that way, as we heard this morning. But then we treat the Lord that way. Now oh, it's Sunday. Cup, bread, service is almost over. And tonight you're looking at porn. Tomorrow you're swearing at your boss. You're cursing. You're, you're, you're looking and listening you're looking at stuff, you're listening to stuff, you're entertained by stuff. You, family movie night, tomorrow night, you're, you, you're watching stuff you wouldn't want anyone else here to know about. It concerns me sometimes when people say, oh, the pastor's here. The pastor's here. God is here, always. He's jealous. He wants all of you. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? God's righteous rage, God's holy indignation. Just look at the earlier part of this chapter. A whole generation of some two million Israelites perished in Sinai. Look at verse 8. 23,000 immoral ones struck dead. And you want to tell me God is not jealous? Or that you're stronger than he is? God's jealousy 
an attribute that is a great comfort when you're obeying God, but a great threat when you stray and when you drift. Never box with God. Your arms are too short. Do you see Paul's point there? Are we stronger than he? It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That's why we examine ourselves as we come to the Lord's table. It's why we take things like membership serious in the body of Christ. As you're about to be served communion tonight, our stewards, as it were, are extending to you, saying to the best of our knowledge, in light of the, the statements and the warnings that are given every time we come to the table, we trust that you are a believer, that you are one of us, that you worship the same Lord as we do. And if not, we would, in love, ask you to refrain, lest you bring God's own judgment upon yourself. And that's why it's best and normal as soon as possible. If you're visiting from another church, different story. Church that preaches the same gospel as ours, welcome, dine with us. But if someone's been coming to a church for months and years and never commits themselves to membership, never submits themselves to the leaders of that church, never wants to make it loud and clear that their colors are nailed to the mast and that I am Christ and Christ alone, it raises questions. Should you be partaking of this meal? Do you understand what it represents to be a covenant community as we talked about this morning in our membership meeting, to be one family, to be the Lord's people who come joyfully, who know that Christ is our only righteousness. We don't deserve this. We're not worthy, but we have a clear conscience. We're not pretenders. My last prayer with Titus on the phone a couple days ago was these kids who go to a Christian university and they are first class hypocrites. I had a professor once who, from the seminary, went up to meet with someone at the university where Titus is at Masters, and the student across from him bowed, said, Grace, brief little prayer, thanks for the food, and then he got up and started whinging and moaning, complaining about the food. Dr. Montoya said, Excuse me, I don't eat with hypocrites. I'm going to be, I'm going to sit with someone else for this meal. (laughs) May God give us that kind of courage to say, he, we're his, we're his alone. We're not playing games. If people are in the world, they're dining at the demon's table. This is serious business. And so let's bow our heads as we come to this feast. Let me read to you as your heads are bowed even what we say in our declaration of faith. That the Lord's Supper is a time of communion with Christ, remembering him through the bread and the cup that depict his broken body and shed blood on our behalf. That's what this meal is about. You take a moment, just reflect in your own heart. What's the Lord taught you, taught us? What does it mean to be a church that doesn't provoke his jealousy? A church that does not aggravate his holy, exclusive right and his pure possessiveness that we would be his and his alone. Worldliness is a continual danger for us. We live in an age that has perfected the worldly church. It's almost impossible to grow a church today if it's not worldly, worldly music, worldly leaders, worldly sermons, worldly dress and clothing and behavior. Pray the Lord would deliver us as a church and you from even a hint of worldliness. And that we would come to this table dining with Jesus alone, not with demons. You take a moment and then I'll pray. forgive us. Again, we pray with that saint of old, the dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. O Lord, sin and Satan are so very subtle. Preaching can be an idol. 
church and ministry can be an idol. A godly, beautiful wife, precious sons and uh, successful sons and daughters and grandchildren and friendships and a good job and any other number of innocent created things that you give us can so easily be turned into golden calves in the name of God that we bow down to. Oh Lord, cleanse us, forgive us, teach us more of what it is that you are jealous. You are, it is right and good and best for you to seek your own honor in your own name and for us to share in that zeal for your exclusive honor. Thank you that you love us enough through your word, through the preaching and teaching of your word and through Christian fellowship and friendship and encouragement and accountability and through the the means of grace at the Lord's table to regularly confront our idols and to call us back to our first love, the Lord Jesus. Thank you that you who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it and you will not let worldliness have the last say. No matter how much secularism seems to be encroaching and uh, advancing on almost every front. It is almost impossible for churches to have a, a Sunday night service anymore. For the same people that came on Sunday morning, thank you for this precious church body. Thank you for this rare little, one of the last vestiges. Uh, uh, and we don't want to get the Elijah complex. We know there are many who have not bowed the knee to Baal. But we acknowledge it is all too rare. And it's, that doesn't That says little about us and it says a whole lot more about the worldliness of our day where the Lord's day has disappeared and the world owns our weekends. Lord, please teach us wherever worldliness, wherever dining with the devil has contaminated us, cleanse us, Lord, creating me a clean heart. Oh God, renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Search me, oh God, as the psalmist prayed. Know my heart, try me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way, any idolatrous way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Oh Lord, may we worship you and you alone as we learned last week. From you, through you, to you are all things. To you alone belongs the glory. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in our great Savior and Redeemer's name as we come to his table now. Amen.